Okay, so uh, thank you very much for coming along this evening, everybody. Um, this is the last of the series of beginners evenings, and uh, Phil is going to talk about harvesting honey and autumn and winter management. Am I showing my screen? The, the sugar puff. Yes. Well, I put this on. I wasn't quite sure what age group we'd have, but it sounds like everyone here is old enough to remember these adverts. To tell them about the honey. I moment. can remember these adverts. <laughs> I mean, the cereal we now know is really bad for our teeth and our health, isn't it? It's all processed, but it was lovely at the time, and I love those adverts. So I'll tell you about the honey, mummy. Let's see. Okay, this is quite a simple talk because it's meant to be for beginners, so uh, forgive me if I'm stating the obvious, but uh, I think we all probably know it, but here we go. So nectar, ne bees collect nectar, which is what they make honey out of. It's the thing that they use to produce energy to keep them alive. They use it during all their lives when they're flying around and doing their work and they store up some for winter if they get enough. Nectar is a watery solution of sugar, mostly fructose and glucose and lots of sucrose. There is other, uh, there are other sugars in there like mannose and things, but these are the main sugars. There are also traces of protein and salts and other things that the bees need to live on. Nectar is mostly water with a little bit of sugar. Now, if the bees were to store this in its raw state, it would very soon ferment and spoil and it would take up a lot of space. So what they have to do to store it is to remove all the water, most of the water, make it a strong enough sugar solution that nothing can grow in it. That way it won't spoil and it will last over winter and keep them going. Apparently some nectar can have up to 70% sugar in it, but I don't know any plants like that here. I think mostly it's about 10 to 20% where we are. Oh. Oh, there we are. So foragers, as we know, go out, find honey, or find nectar, bring it back to the hive, hand it over to some house bees who take it into the hive and process it. Um, what they do is they suck it in and out of their honey stomachs to evaporate the water. They exude a little drop of honey, of nectar, and the water evaporates. They also add enzymes to it, which break down the sucrose, which is a disaccharide, into glucose and fructose, which are monosaccharides. And it's that form that they can use. They have to do that to eat it, to be able to process it. They evaporate the water until it's about 15 to 20%. And of that amount of, of that little water, nothing can grow in the, in the honey at all. So it will store indefinitely. Um, as I've said there, it preserves the honey, stopping fungi and bacteria from growing on it. And that's why honey can be good for dressing wounds in certain situations. If you've got an infected wound and you put honey on it, it will desiccate the bacteria or whatever's growing in the wound. So people do use it in dressings to sort of kill off any bacteria or pathogens that are in your wound. In the hive, honey is stored in the brood combs. The, the bees store a ring of honey above the brood. There's also a ring of pollen there that you can see on that slide there. The white stuff at the very top is honey that's been capped. Then there'd be a row of pollen underneath it and then the brood is below it. Um, they cap it to prevent water moisture being absorbed. Because honey is such a strong solution of sugar, it will absorb water from the environment and that will dilute it and possibly lead to it fermenting. So that's why they cap it over. And then when they need it, they can uncap it and eat it. They need to get water to eat it. They can't eat it neat. So they either come out for water or they can probably get water from the hive walls where it condenses sometimes. A bit like us, you can't drink neat orange squash. You have to dilute it before you can drink it. They feed themselves, they feed the queen and they make brood food, bee bread to feed the bees. Um, now, the bees will keep honey in the brood, around the brood nest, but to make it easier for beekeepers, we put supers on top. And that way, that's a space for the bees to put the honey separate from the brood. We separate them with the queen excluder so that the, bee, the queen can't get up to lay. It's for our own benefit. It just makes it easier for us to take the honey off. There's no brood in it. It doesn't disturb the bees as much. And you can see on that picture, there's some nice super frames just uh, beginning to be filled up with honey. Um, some people don't use queen excluders and they say that the queen doesn't go up there, but I wouldn't risk it. 
Oh, on the subject of supers, for beginners who might not know, because nectar is so runny, they need to collect a lot of it. And um, you need a lot of space for them to process this honey. So when you put your supers on, you need to put at least two on to begin with, and maybe even more, because nectar takes up you know, three or more times as much space as honey. So they need somewhere to put all the nectar while it's coming in, while they dry it down and put it into the storage. So you need lots of space. Don't just put on one super, and when it's full, put another one on. You need to give them plenty of space. Once the summer comes to an end, and um, apparently, a researcher I, spoke, I saw recently giving a talk says that most of the honey is produced, most of the excess surplus honey is produced when there's a nectar flow and when the temperature is about 20 degrees centigrade. He had his hives on uh, balances on, on, on a scale and he recorded the temperature every day and the amount of weight gain. And he said if the temperature is below 20 degrees, the bees eat what they collect. So the, temp the, the weight of the hive stays constant. And it's only during one week in spring and two weeks in summer when the temperature went above 20 degrees that the weight of the hive rocketed. So he was saying that that's the only time they can really make plenty of spare honey. So his message was, if the temperature is quite low at the end of summer, don't leave your supers on in the hope that they might make a bit more, because the chances are they won't. They'll just be eating what they collect. For some reason this isn't... Oh, there we are. Now, so, oh, sorry, I've got to go back. I'm just, uh, yeah, so once the honey is ready to extract, you need to get the bees off of the supers. Um, the bees don't just spend time in the super processing the honey, but there are so many bees in the hive in the summer, they might be living up there, just hanging around because it's space. So you need to get the honey or get the bees out of the supers. We do that with uh, some kind of that one-way valve, really. This one here is called a rhomboid uh, oh, yeah. board. Hello. Uh, hives come with the little white things called porter bee escapes, but they tend to get stuck and glued up and don't really work very well. So a lot of people use these kind of rhomboid uh, excluder, rhomboid clearer boards instead. The way it works is you pin it underneath the crown board and the bees come down through the hole in the top crawl out of the, ed the ends of the uh, rhomboid inside and can't find their way back in because there's so many holes, they try and follow the scent, but the scent, the holes aren't where the exits are, if you know what I mean. So this works like a one-way valve. It's a good way of clearing the bees. Look, you can clear a super in a day with these sort of uh, clearings. Then you can come back, take the super off, take it inside and extract the honey. Sometimes you don't get all the bees out, so there might be a few left on there. Now, if you do what I did and made the mistake, I thought, well, it's around the hives, there's so many bees, I'll take the super away onto the patio where I've got a table and brush off the excess bees. And then I can take the supers in to extract. But the bees in the super could well be house bees that have never been outside the hive, so they don't know their way back to the hive. So if you do what I just said and brush off all the bees somewhere else, the poor little things don't know where to go and they just fly around trying to find home. It's obviously not there. They don't know where the hive is, so they just get more and more annoyed and they annoy everybody until they die. So if there are bees in the supers that haven't cleared, you need to brush them off near the hive. That way they can find their way back into the hive. Otherwise, you might as well, if you take them away, you might as well just kill them because they're just going to be a nuisance until they die anyway. I found that the hard way. I did it outside the back door once and we couldn't go up the house the next day because there were so many bees flying around. So that's that. Oh yes, if you're using these sort of uh, clearer boards, you need to give them some space, the bees some space to move into. So you can put an eek or an empty super underneath just to make room. Otherwise it might be a bit crowded in the actual beehive and there won't be room for them. But, no. So, if you're lucky, you'll get supers of, uh, of honey like this, where it's all been capped. I mean, these, these frames are sort of show quality. You could put these into a honey show and you might even win a prize. Uh, if it's capped like this, it means that the honey's ready. It's been, uh, it's dry enough, they've taken out all the moisture and it's, it's perfect for extraction. It won't ferment. They'll only cap the honey when it's down to the right moisture content. If it's like this, however, a bit of capping, but lots of open honey, 
you can't quite be sure. So if you extract it and it's too runny, it will ferment and that spoils it, you can't eat that. So the best thing is to test it. So the best way to do that is using a refractometer. The way that works is you take a little sample of honey, I'm doing it here with a cocktail stick. That picture's a refractometer. You put the honey on that little, as you can see, smear it onto the glass, flip the cover over and push it down. Then you look through the eyepiece and it will give you a reading of how much uh, sugar is in, or how much water is in the honey. And there are a couple of the readings. So the one on the left is uh, 19%, that was from last year. If it's below 20%, it should be okay. But my refractometer is quite a cheap one from eBay and I don't know how accurate it is. So I wouldn't go much above 19% because you might be you know, running the risk of it fermenting. Last year, 17% was perfect. Uh, that's a lovely reading. If you haven't got a refractometer, a rule of thumb or a simple way to check is if you shake the frame, if you hold it uh, horizontally and shake it and little droplets fall out, that means the nectar is not ripe enough, the honey is not ripe enough, it's still runny and it's, you can't extract it. But if you're going to do this test, it's best to do it over the hive so that if it does rain down, you haven't wasted all that nectar. The bees clear it up off of the frames that it falls onto. If you do it in the kitchen, like I did once, it goes all over the floor, you've got a horrible sticky mess. <laughs> and you won't be uh, thanked because you'll try tram trample it all through the house. And Phil, just to say, the association has got a refractometer for members to use. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, so people can have a go with the technology if they want to. It's very good. You can calibrate it. I think olive oil is 22.5% or something like that. So you can find it on the internet. So that's the way you can adjust the refractometer. It's meant to be used at 20 degrees centigrade. And once it's calibrated, it shouldn't change. But I test one every year just to be on the safe side. So when you come to uh, extract your honey, you can do it in a kitchen. Some people, if they've got lots of hives, might have a, a specially built bee house or an outhouse that they use. You can do it in the kitchen as long as it's hygienic. Have to remember this is a food product, so um, you don't want any bits and pieces in it. <laughs> Funny story, my neighbour next door, when we moved in, we helped her out with various things. And she'd be always bringing around cakes or apple pies to say thank you for doing a job. It was lovely. But everything she brought around had a dog hair in it. <laughs> we don't really mind. We're not, uh, I'm not hygiene freaks. It was a bit of a joke, find the dog hair. Then we got a dog. And we find dog hairs everywhere. When you open the dishwasher, when it's been on and clean, you find the dog hair on the clean plate. When you open butter, you find the dog hair on the butter. And I think the fact is it, it's in the air or it's on your clothes and it just falls off of you. You don't want to find dog hairs in your honey. So just be careful that you keep everything clean. Uh, and um, in the same vein, when you take your super off the hive, I wouldn't put it on the grass next to your beehive because you don't know if a hedgehog's wandered across there or a poo or you know a fox has been around. It's best to keep your hive your, your supers on a tray. I've got a gardening gravel tray there that I use. Just something to keep the super off of the ground and keep it clean. Although you, you do sieve the honey when it comes off, you know you don't want to get bits of dirt in there, and uh, this needs to be careful. Another tip, when you start doing your extracting, leave the windows shut because honey will attract bees from all around. And if you leave a window open in half an hour, your house will be full of bees. These are all lessons that you learn the hard way. <laughs> Try and remember. So you've got your honey, you've got your supers in, uh, all your equipment ready. Oh, I was going to say on the back one. So there I've got my supers. The extractor is the white thing on the ground. I've got a bowl with the knife and a scraper for the honey cappings, a bucket and my sieves. Honey extraction can be really messy if you're disorganised. But if you're organised and think ahead and have a bowl of warm water and cloths, it isn't too messy. But if you spill anything, clear it up straight away. Otherwise, you're going to be regretting it, I would say. So the first thing you have to do is uncap the honey. This frame I've got here, I only had a bit of honey at the top, but it was a really poor year, so I thought I'd extract it anyway. Now this one I'm using an uncapping fork. Now I remember Kath was surprised that people use uncapping forks to uh, extract honey and she used a knife. But I've found it, this uncapping fork much easier than the knife. I think it's all down to technique. You know, you practice and you work out the best way, but this is what I found is the best way. If you keep all the cappings in a bowl, you can either give them back to the bees and the bees will take the honey, the bits of honey that are on the cappings off, 
or you can spin them if you've got lots and get a bit of honey out or people make mead out of them i give them back to the bees so that they can have the honey some people use a heat gun a hot air gun if you just flash the hot air gun over the surface of the comb the cappings just pop and sort of shrink back apparently i've not tried it but some people do that so once you've uncapped your super frames you put them into the extractor now this extractor is called a is it a radial or a tange tangential one i think anyway, the one we've got here holds four frames four super frames or two brood frames and you have to spin each side separately so as it spins round, the outer side the honey is spun off and then you turn them over and do the same for the other side there's a radial type where they all go in all the frames go in like spokes of a wheel and i think that just spins it in one uh, they're bigger uh, this is the one that the club has that i borrowed if you're using this sort of extractor um you have to be careful because honey is quite heavy so as you're spinning up the first side the honey on the back side starts to push and it can distort the combs so the best idea is to half spin one side then take the frames out turn them over spin the other side completely because by then the other half side hasn't got much in it then turn them over a second time and spin out the rest of the honey on the first side that way you avoid distorting the comb um, and that's very well so that's me uh, giving it a spin and there's a little video of the frame spinning tap or a valve at the bottom of the extractor so you open that put your bucket underneath with a double sieve the double sieve strains out wax and bees legs and little bits of dirt that's in there into a food grade bucket and that's it then you've extracted your honey because as i said honey will extract water from the moist will absorb water from the atmosphere you need to put a lid on it as soon as you can the longer you leave it uncovered the more likely it is to absorb some water so um, pop the lid on once the bucket's full and uh, there you go, you've got your honey extracted. I like to have a different bucket for each hive. That way, if the bees are collecting honey or collecting nectar rather from different plants, you might get slightly different flavoured honey from each hive. So keeping it separate just means that you can have different flavoured honey. You don't have to, you can mix it all together. But this way, I, as I said, I got some heather honey from one hive one year only from one hive not from the others so the fact that I kept them separate in separate buckets meant that that the honey stayed uh, pure it was very nice if it was all mixed up it would all sort of taste the same after the honey is settled for a few days you let all the bubbles settle out and leave bits of well there shouldn't be any dirt in there but just let the bubbles settle then you can transfer it into a, a bottling bucket I suppose I don't know what it's called with a, a valve a honey gate like this um, you can wash your jars, I do them in the dishwasher on a cool rinse, pop them in the oven just to dry off. You don't need to sterilise them because honey is sterile, nothing will grow in it, but you just want to make sure they're clean, there's no dust in them, because if they're stored in a box in a warehouse somewhere, you might have the odd spider or the odd dust, so washing them is quite a good idea. And then you fill them up. Uh, if you fill them when the jars are warm, it prevents bubbles forming on the surface of the glass, which doesn't matter, but it doesn't look very nice if you're selling it. Uh, so this way, because the sides of the glass are warm, the bubbles don't really form and you can get a nice, nice looking honey. Uh, you can weigh the jars to get the right weight, but most jars have a little line around the top, which is the fill line. If you fill it up to there, you should be okay. Um, I know some people that use scales and they check every single jar and they have a teaspoon and they just top up so that it's exactly on the, the weight. I don't do that. I sometimes just maybe go slightly over so that you know that it's got the right amount in. I'm not sure you're meant to do that. I think it should be exact, but uh, if it's just thought to sales, it's not really better too much. And then the last thing to do is to label it. Here's some pictures of my honey, which I labelled. I've stopped using these labels because they're plastic and someone told me you know you shouldn't be using plastic which is quite right so I've gone back to paper labels now but it did look nice I thought with regard to labeling there are regulations you have to have uh, certain things on it uh, description your name your address or your contact details the weight the weight has to be in a certain size of font but all those regulations are 
readily available. Uh, you can find them online somewhere. If you're giving it away, I don't think you need to put a label on, but it's much nicer to have a label, I think. It looks nice and it just adds to the value of the product. Honey costs a lot. You, know, you, send, you sell it for maybe five pounds a pound or six pounds a pound. It's going to look good, look like it's worth it. Now, <clears throat> eventually most honey will crystallize. But some people like buying runny honey and it lasts, my honey, last sort of four or five months running before it starts to set. When it crystallizes, it's a bit crunchy and it's not very nice. You can warm it up to melt it again. But what I've found I prefer to do now is just do a thing called soft set honey. This is a, a, a method where you actually make the honey set, but because it sets quickly, the crystals are very small and therefore it's not crunchy, but it's smooth. And it sort of comes out like peanut butter consistency, I would say. And it doesn't run off the toast when you have it on toast, whereas runny honey, you know, butter your toast, put your honey on, and it all ends up down your arm, which isn't very nice. So um, it's the relative amounts of glucose and fructose that determine whether honey sets or not, I think. The more glucose in there, the more it will set. As I said there, glucose granulates, whereas fructose remains fluid. You can't change this, it's whatever's in the nectar. Uh, some things like oilseed rape is full of glucose and it sets really quickly. Other things, I've got one jar of honey that's about seven years old and it hasn't crystallised at all, just a few grains in the bottom of the jar. So that must be mostly fructose, I suppose. If you want to do this soft set, uh, these three jars here are halfway through setting. What you do is you, uh, if your honey has crystallised, you have to melt it, warm it up in the oven or a very, very gentle heat, 40 degrees centigrade or so. If it hasn't crystallised, you can just do the soft set straight away. And what you do is you get some honey that's the right consistency that you like, which is a soft, lovely soft one. I used some organic honey from Tesco as my seed honey. Warm it up very gently until it, you can pour it. Tip it into your bucket of honey. You need about a jar of the seed honey to maybe 20, 10 to 15 pounds of runny honey. Pour it in, stir it up twice a day for two or three days, and you'll see the whole thing starting to go opaque. And then you bottle it while it's still runny enough to flow. And over the course of a few more days, it sets. And that way, it won't crystallize into crunchy honey. It will stay soft and smooth. And it lasts forever. I've got honey several years old, and it's just as good as it was when I did it. And most people I know prefer it this way now, so that's how I do most of my honey. This is what happens when your honey crystallizes. Now, on the left, I've just put, uh, on my left, it might be your right, I'm not sure. It's um, heather honey. And um, heather is really interesting because the honey from heather is, what's the word when it forms a gel? Um, Thixotrophic. Thixotrophic, thixotropic, thank you, Helen. That means it's a gel rather than a liquid. And it, when this crystallizes, rather than all the crystals falling to the bottom, they stay suspended and it's a bit like um, little sugar hailstones in honey. I don't know if you remember those sweets, are they called rainbow drops? Where you get loads and loads of sweets in the mouth, the tiny little, tiny little um, sugary lumps. That's what this is like. It's really nice to eat it with a spoon. So that's, that's okay, that sort of crystallization. But on the other picture, what happens when sugar crystallizes out of solution the liquid that remains is less concentrated because all the sugars come out of it. So the more it crystallizes, the less sugar is in solution and then that liquid can start to ferment. And that's what's happened on the jar on the right. So I don't know if you can see, but there are bubbles, small bubbles on the glass. And when I took the lid off, it overflowed because the pressure of the liquid, or the air, or the gases in there, pushed the honey out. And you, you can smell alcohol. It's, it's nice on my, hand, on my porridge in the morning. It's very tasty but you couldn't sell it. So that's the problem. That's what happens if your honey has got too much water in it to start with, if it was over 20%, or if it was close to that. I think this was probably 19% the 19% one. And um, so as the honey is crystallized and the sugars come out of solution, the remaining liquid has started to ferment. So that's just a warning. But I thought the head of honey looks so nice, I had to show it. You can, reduce crystallization even more 
by filtering your honey, not just through sieves, but you can get an actual filter, uh, a 200 micron filter. It's like a cone, which is hat upside down. You put over a bucket, you warm your honey so that it will flow, pour it through the filter, and that removes all of the tiny little particles, which would act as seeds, crystals, to make the honey crystallise. That would make it last a lot longer. It can remove some of the pollen, some of the larger pollen as well, which people like pollen in their honey, so I don't do that. But I think if you've got a long storage life, you might be able to do that and make the runny honey stay runny much longer. But for me, it's a bit of a half faff. I don't have enough honey and it doesn't last long enough to need that. So once you've extracted your honey, you're left with super frames that look a bit like this. Uh, it's a bit of a mess, but that's not a problem. The bees will clean all that up nicely. You can either put these frames back into these super boxes, wrap them in some plastic. I use the um, recycling bags, they're just the right size. And you can store them wet. This is called wet. And then next year, when you put them on the hives, the bees will be straight up there, they'll be attracted by the honey, they'll clean it all up, and they'll be using the supers. Or you can put these supers back on the hive and let the bees clean them out in the autumn, supplement their feed, and then take them off a few days later and store them dry. That's what I do. Um, you can do either, I think. It doesn't really matter. When you store them wet or dry, you need to keep pests out because mice and wax moths will be attracted to them. So if you put a crown board top and bottom or a bit of wood, something on the stack top and bottom to stop any pests getting in uh, and chewing through your plastic, that would help. Right, that's the end of honey. Are there any questions or should we just go on to the last bit that's about uh, autumn and winter storage? I can't see, my, I can't get my cursor to work, so I can't see any questions. If there are any question, please? Yes. Hi, it's Ian. Hi. Right. Um, is there, if you find a honey that you particularly like one year, is there a way of, I mean, I, I know the answer because you obviously can't control where the bees go, but is there a way of quality controlling the taste so that you can guarantee you get the same tasting honey? Each I don't above? know. I suppose you could blend, I know the supermarkets blend honey, so they'll they'll try and make it all standardised. I don't know what you could do yourself to do that, no. I mean, other than maybe, like I said, extracting each hive into a different bucket, then you can try each honey and you might find that one's a bit too strong and you can mix that with a weak one. That might be a possibility. Um, I know you can get your honey sample. I think the National Botanic Gardens was doing a, a project where you could send in honey and they'd analyse the pollen in the honey so they could tell you possibly where the honey had come from, but that wouldn't help you with quality control as such, but at least it would tell you what your bees were feeding on that year. But yeah, you, you, said, you said earlier about, um, about the, the heather honey, so did you know at that point that it was heather, or was it only after you'd extracted it that you knew it was heather? It was only as I was extracting it, because when you extract it and you spin it in the extractor, normally the honey just sort of flies out onto the edges of the extractor and runs down, but the heather honey had little blobs, it, blobs stuck to the extractor edge. So I knew that was different. And then I think later someone told me that it was heather honey. But other than that, I know I don't know what you could do. Um, the, the only other thing, Ian, would be to think about, and it's not really giving you the information you want, where you, people will say, I've got summer blossom honey, or, you know, you could say early spring honey. And so you're having to make sure that you harvest it at certain times of the year when you know that the bees have worked certain crops because that what was that is what was out in the last month or so do you see what i mean so if you if there's a blend that you like and you know that blend comes from a particular time of the year then you wouldn't necessarily want to wait until the end of the season where it's the, you know the bees have harvested they've worked other other nectar sources but i mean it's not an exact that's not an exact science is it but that's yeah yes that's exactly uh, yeah i forgot to say that some years we get spring honey here. Last year we had some lovely hawthorn. The hawthorn was dripping with flowers. And so I extracted some honey at the end of May or something. And so that was very different. That's quite strong honey. And then the summer wildflower honey we get is quite mild. So yeah, if you extract in separate months, you can at least keep those two separate. If you leave it on all year and just take it in the, in the autumn, then you, you're lumped in together. 
So <laughs> I've got friends down south, and they 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 get tons of honey, but they extract almost every month. The first month they get oilseed rape honey, the next month they get um, hawthorn honey, and they get summer honey, and they get later summer honey. So if you have enough, you could extract several times, and that would, as as Helen said, that would keep the floral the floral honey separates. That's one of the questions a lot of um, non-beekeepers will ask is how do we know that the honey that we're buying in the supermarket for instance that is branded orange blossom honey how do we know that that's from the an orange blossom and I'm and others on the call may have others add or say that I'm wrong but the so the beekeeper will have put their hives in that crop in order to work that so there's there's lavender honey that you get in the uk the beekeepers will have put their hives in that crop but then in order to be able to sell that honey with that name then that honey can be tested and i think it's the pollen content isn't it that's tested mm. in order to work out what that honey is so for instance um I was got some feedback at one of our own association honey shows that I was I put some heather that I heather honey that I had and actually um, it wasn't heather it was heather blends and the thought was that actually if it had gone through a pollen test it wouldn't have enough heather pollen in it to be able to be called heather honey it would have to be called a heather blend honey because the pollen content would, would, was lower from that. Yeah, that's, that's correct, uh, Helen. Um, so if you're a commercial a <clears throat> beekeeper, a large, large producer, you'll be regularly checked by trading standards and um, that's what they do is they'll, they'll check the pollen in the um, in the honey and you can do it yourself. I mean, if you, once you get to know, I'm sure Richard can help us out here, if, you, if you're if you quite good at identifying pollens, you can um, spin the pollen out of her honey sample and, uh, and do it yourself. The, the only thing about that which has intrigued me a little, and I mean, I can see the correlation between pollen and nectar, but we do know that bees can move the pollen around within frames as they do nectar. So that association, why it may be that the pollen and the nectar correlation isn't quite as simple as uh, what we use in terms of um, uh, grading pollen grazing honey but it's probably the best that we can get because when we're not presumably able to identify different types of nectar sources from under the microscope but it's easier to identify pollen sources because every single pollen um cell is a different shape isn't it rob they're really, yeah, really yeah. distinctive aren't they? Exactly right. I think, they, I think to qualify, it's sort of like 80% of the pollen has to be from the plant orange blossom because orange blossom honey because i recognize that like helen said there's more than one pollen in the hive so I think it's, it doesn't have to be exclusively orange blossom to be orange blossom honey, but it's the majority of it is something, some percentage, I think. Mm. It, it's, it's quite difficult, Phil, to, because not the amount of pollen that different plants give out varies greatly. So, for example, um, Will, Rose Bay Willow Herb gives very, very little pollen. So mm. when you're actually measuring it, you have to apply sort of different factors to it, different sort of equations as it were to, to find out how much is actually from that particular plant so it is quite complicated yeah that's that's really useful to hear Richard because I often think how I think there's a lot of margin for error because I but I'm assuming for for branding purposes and labeling purposes we're trying to find something that's relatively simple to use but I think that it's, there must be quite a lot of variability within that but if you think about it we were told we've been told so often that the foragers come back to the hive and pass their honey across to receiver bees who then take it up into the hive to process. So those foragers aren't actually in the hive. So any honey, any pollen that's on them won't get into the hive. It's more like the, the bees collecting pollen that go into the hive. So it's possible that the pollen in the honey isn't the same pollen that the honey came from, isn't it? I think it feels like it's a bit of a blunt instrument, but it's the best we've got in terms of trying to Yes. I suppose if, if, it's, if you're saying it's exclusively one crop, that's um, probably all they're going to be feeding on for honey and pollen, isn't it? So you're more likely, if there's lots of, a high percentage of one pollen, chances are that's what they've been foraging on for everything, for pollen and honey. But, but generally, unless you've got a massive area of a single crop, like, um, like yeah, thousands of acres of sunflowers, you can't... Like heather or something in Scotland. It's a specific honey, can you really? Yes, yeah. especially here. I think with us, there's so few flowers where I live that 
it's it's just wildflower honey full stop. And yeah. Bramble, a bit of willow herb, a bit of dandelion, whatever's around, really. That's Thank you, Phil, for solving a problem for me, because I hadn't realised that fructose didn't granulate, and I've had jars of honey that have had half set with a little layer of liquid above it or a liquid at the bottom. And I, I hope I, that's right. I, I hope I told you right. So. <laughs> I think uh, thank you. <laughs> hmm. uh, there might be other reasons too, but that's that's what I seem to remember being told. I didn't actually fact check that. But I think it's right. <laughs> and fructose doesn't taste as sweet either. I've noticed that um, my heather honey. Well, that wouldn't make sense. The, the granules in my heather honey aren't as sweet as sugar. Maybe maybe glucose and fructose aren't as sweet as sucrose. I don't know. Anyway. Does that answer your question, Ian? Oh, he's uh, gone. <laughs> it's an interesting discussion, anyway. I suspect it's. Um, I suspect it could go on uh, indefinitely, <laughs> something like that. But yes, yeah. thank you for that. Well, enough. When we um, do our honey tasting at the show, we all you know, maybe half a dozen or a dozen of us bring in honey to sample. By the end of the tasting, no one can tell the difference between one honey and the next. <laughs> But that's obviously some, some honey is a really strong taste. Tree honey uh, is much stronger than wildflower honey. I really liked the, head, uh, the uh, hawthorn honey we had last year, but Norman hated it. And I know Anne loves tree honey, but some people don't like it. So it's quite a variety of tastes. Anyway, moving on then. Yeah. There's not much left. It's just a brief, briefly what we do in the autumn, uh, which is now, I guess. So it's time. When now I keep my bees on double brood, so there's plenty of room in the brood for them to store honey as well. Uh, they, you know, the brood takes up a certain area, and there's lots of spare frames for honey. If you're on single brood, especially, that could be full of brood. So when you take your honey off in the supers, they might have very little honey left to live on. So you have to be careful when you take your honey to make sure they've got enough food and, and feed them almost straight away if you've taken it. You may be, they may be starving within days if the weather turns and there's no honey in the hive. So you do need to feed them um, a little bit at least. They, they'll keep on collecting honey, or nectar rather, through the autumn if they can. Um, but you need to make sure you haven't left them starving. Yes, you need to, one job that you could do in the autumn, if you've got some small colonies, the chances are they might not make it through the winter, especially if they're very small, if they're split, maybe the queen's late to mate. So it can be a good idea to unite small colonies. Two weak colonies might not make it through the winter, but one strong colony will. So it's a good idea to unite weak colonies so they're big enough to last the winter. Then feed them. The main jobs for the autumn are feeding and treating for varroa. But when you treat for varroa, the bees often won't take food down while they're being treated. So you need to make sure you feed them before you treat them. So you could feed them for a few days. You can get a lot of food into them in a few days. They'll take down, you know, I think, I think uh, Linda said they can take a gallon in a few days if you keep giving it to them. So you need to feed them, then treat the brewer, and then feed again. And the second feed you're topping up for the whole of winter. So I think the next, we'll, we'll go on to feeding in a minute. But we feed, so give them a bit of feed first, then treat the brewer. You don't have to treat for varroa, you, know, you, might, you might test the bees and find there's not much there. But I think most hives have varroa, so it's a good idea, especially for beginners, to treat. Assume there's varroa there and treat. There are two ways at the moment, or three ways that you can treat. One is Max, which some of you may have used. It's um, formic acid, which is a natural compound. In, it's found in honey anyway, in the hive. Max strips goes on for a week, and the vapours perfuse the hive and kill the varroa. Stops the queen laying, I found whenever I use Max, the queen stopped laying for a week. Some of my queens died when I used Max, so I've gone off of it, but other people have found it very successful. Apigard, on the other hand, is a thymol based varroa treatment. It works the same way, the fumes go through the hive and the bees move the gel, and as moving the gel, that spreads it around and kills most of the varroa. That takes a month, it's two treatments, two weeks apart. So uh, if you're doing the apigard especially, you've got to make sure they've got enough food uh, to last. And apigard taints the honey, so if you're going to be treating, you need to take the honey off before you treat. Max, you can use any time of the year. They say it doesn't taint honey, but when I've used it, 
everyone said my honey tasted like fizzy lemon and it did it was quite citrusy so i, I suspect maybe max does affect the honey slightly but i don't know the other option is oxalic acid uh, people some people have a vaporizer this is like a little heated spoon that you put some crystals on you put it in the hive you pass a current through it from a battery it vaporizes and it kills the varroa and you do that three times five days apart and that kills the varroa as well you need to treat the varroa because the bees now will be making their winter bees and you don't want the winter bees to be infected with all the viruses that varroa spread so it's important to treat now so you get healthy winter bees and then they'll survive into the spring uh, and then feeding, uh, fee bees need about 40 pounds of stores to last the winter, which is eight frames worth of honey, more or less. If you use insulated hives, so poly hives, they use less food. Um, I think Tracy was saying that she's had to take frames out, frames are stored out in the spring because the bees haven't eaten them. And I found the same with my hives. I insulate my hives and I often take frames of food out to give the queen room to lay in the spring. So they don't need quite as much, but rule of thumb is 40 pounds of stores for winter. Um, what else is on this slide? Hopefully they'll have honey of their own. You know, bees need honey. Honey is good for them, but um, sugar is just as good as an energy store. This time of year, you can give them a heavy honey. It's called heavy. It's called one to one, but that's an imperial measurement. It's one pound to one pint. In metric, it's about a kilogram to 630 mils of water. That's sort of double strength honey that you feed in the winter for storing. The less water there is in there, the easier it is the bees to remove the rest of the water. In the spring, you use a one-to-one -one, uh, solution, which is half, half a kilogram of sugar to three six hundred and thirty mils of water, and that's more likely for them to use and eat rather than store. But you can use either. I think they've done some tests and they they fed bees in the winter with one-to-one -one or two-to-one. They've taken down just as much and done just as well. So I think the bees will cope with whatever you give them. Uh, you can buy this stuff called Invert Bee. It's a syrup, it's made up for you. And the bees love it. I worked it out, it, it's, it costs twice the price per amount of sugar than it does buying sugar in the supermarket. Tesco sell five pound, no, five kilo bags for six, five kilo bags for three pounds. 15 I think it is, so it's about 60p a, a kilo. So if you've got lots and lots of bees, perhaps it's such a hassle making up your own solution that you could buy in that bee. But I found I can just make it up quite easily each day and feed it to them so I buy sugar now. Some people just feed with fondant. There's a bag of fondant there, but you can buy big boxes of fondant and get these big uh, 10 or 14 kilo packs of fondant. Some people just put one of those in the hive every winter and give them nothing else and the bees seem to like that just as much. So any sort of sugar will do. They will actually, when they collect nectar to make honey, I meant to mention this a few years ago, uh, there was a case where someone had blue honey and it turned out that there was an M&M &M sweet factory nearby and they'd left some drums of syrup outside, used drums, but they hadn't been washed, with blue syrup in. And the bees had gone and collected the syrup, brought it back and made blue honey. So the bees don't really mind whether it's, it comes from the plant or it comes from the oil drum or it comes from, you know, they'll just take sugar wherever they can find it. They're quite happy. It's all carbohydrate to them, really, their energy store. So you feed them. Once they're fed, you can shut them all up for the winter. If you heft the hives once a month, say, that means you lift up one side and feel how heavy it is. If it's beginning to feel a bit light after, after Christmas, say, then you might want to put a bit of fondant on just to be on the safe side. Uh, just have to learn by experience uh, doing that. Also, in December, I forgot to mention, people also treat for varroa in December as well. When there's no brood in the hive, or there's very little brood in the hive in early December-ish, you can trickle oxalic acid solution. That will just kill any other varroa that's in there. And that should be fine, maybe nice and healthy then for the spring. That's it. This is the hive in winter. Poor little bees in their little wooden hive. I think it's much too cold for them up here. So a lot of people like polystyrene hives because they're insulated. They keep the bees a bit warmer. They can move around a bit more. They can get to their stores. They don't 
get isolation, starvation, where they can't get to the store because the stores are on the outside of the hive where it's too cold to get to. These polyhives can make it a bit easier for bees to move around and they seem to do much better in them. That's a thought if you're a beginner and you haven't got hives yet, you might want to buy some polyhives or think about polyhives. Well, that's it really. That's the end of this talk. Has anyone got any questions? Phil, you mentioned that you insulate your hives, don't you? Which yes. is one of, um, not many members do that, but you've obviously, and you've done it for a few years now, haven't you? Yes. I wasn't going to mention it because it's beginners. I can show you if you like what I do. Well, um, or I'll talk about it. Either really. Right. So I made some. I I made some hives. Right. So there's, there's the poly hives that Tracy has. Nice poly hives. But because I bought my hives already and they're all made of wood, I didn't want to pay out again. So I made some insulated hives. This is how I made them. I got this stuff. It's called Celatex, or this one's extra firm. It's just this sort of foil-backed insulation that you can buy for houses. I made, uh, cut them out to the right size to slip over the hives, taped up the edges of the aluminium foil, glued them all together, covered them with some white plastic, and painted them because the bees like pretty pictures, don't they? We all know that, and I like pretty pictures. So I basically turned my wooden hives into poly hives. So they're completely enclosed. I don't, I have, I, I have solid floors now in the winter. I don't have mesh floors anymore. So basically that's a cube, six sides of insulation with just a slit for the bees to come in and out into their entrances. And they do really well. Again, I, I, when I open them to have a look, they're often not clustered in the winter because so much warmth is maintained in the hive, they don't need to cluster that tightly. They don't use much stores and they seem to do quite well. And um, Phil, could you tell us why they've got different um, uh, markings on them in different colours? Well, yeah, that was because... Uh, Apparently, um, bees can drift between hives, and if they drift, they can spread disease. So by marking them, the idea is they can recognise their own hives. I'm not entirely sure that you need to, because I think they probably go by positioning as much as anything else, but I just had a bit of spare paint and I thought it looked nice. <laughs> but the idea is, I think, stop drifting. And do they stay in these um, insulated boxes all year, or is it just for the winter? No, I leave them in all year. I, I take them off when I have supers on. If I well, I, I put them on top of the supers, but if I'm doing splits, vertical splits, I have to take them off because I have they can't get in the top entrance. But yeah, I leave them on all year because in the winter they'll keep the heat in, and in the summer they'll keep the hives cool by keeping the sun off of them. That's the that's the idea. Do you think there's any problems with condensation? No, there's not. Well, there is condensation at the bottom, but then um, I think that's good because that means the bees can get the moisture without going outside. I don't know if you saw Tom Seeley's talk uh, last week he gave to the Scottish beekeepers. His, his, his talk was given before at the conventions about water in the hive. And he was saying that he thinks that insulated hives like this and indeed in trees the moisture does tend to condense, but lower down because the top's so well insulated that the heat rises and then the cool air drops. And so moisture condenses on the outer, on the bottom, bottom of the hive and the bees can get to it so they can get water without having to go outside. So I don't get any drips at all on the top. You know. Even without, when I didn't have um, insulated hives, when I just had my hives like this, I had a layer of insulation in the roof. And that way the roof, is always warmer than the sides. So any moisture will condense on the sides and not drip on the bees. So, but in, in the box, if I take the box up in the winter, it is quite wet on the inside, yes. But I think that's a good idea because then the bees can get to it. As in wet on the inside of the insulation rather yeah. than the inside of the wooden box, yeah? Yeah, well, in the insulation, yes. The boxes were dry, the insulation was wet. But you leave a centimetre gap between the insulation and the box so the bees can get up in between the bees can get into the cavity basically between the inner and the outer walls if they want to so they can go and get water from there it does look like you've got a collection of fridge freezers in your <laughs> <laughs> no. unfortunately this some um, cellar tech stuff which i covered it with isn't uv isn't uv uh resistant so they're all falling to bits now the insulation inside's fine but all the outer layers are peeling off so I'm having to think of something else to cover them with. Some people just make them out of the foil-backed insulation and don't cover them or paint them. 
You know you could consider buying yourself some poly hives, don't you? <laughs> I would, if I had a bit of spare money. <laughs> okay, fine, that's fine. If I started again, I would buy poly hives, I think, definitely. But you know, having, having... For those earlier in their career to hear, because hmm. several people, on, well, probably maybe all people on the call, have got different perspectives and are on different journeys with heart polystyrene hives versus wooden hives, aren't we? I'd love to know what Anne's found, having changed from one to the other, because most of us only have one or the other, but Anne has got a perspective. And went and did a bit of big shopping, didn't she, two winters ago? Yeah. Maybe mm -hmm. sometimes you could give a little talk about mm -hmm. the pros and cons that she's found of switching. We don't want to learn about it. Well, not at the moment, no. Yeah. Oh. Okay. I, I, I think I'm now not <laughs> completely convinced about... Um, the ease of the polystyrene hives. Um, they say I've had rat problems. Oh, the yeah. rats uh, got and chewed away at the polystyrene. Mm. We got, got into the um, the supers, which if they had had wooden hives, they wouldn't have been able to do. Mm. Um, they they are difficult to clean to keep clean. Yes. The inside. They do need more attention um, painting and keeping keeping decent. Do you squash bees when you put them together? Because I think, aren't they? You do, yes. Election? Yes, you do, definitely. Mm. Um, there's many different kinds of, of um, polystyrene hives, as there are many different kinds of different um, sizes of um, uh, wooden hives. But they... If you start with wooden hives, I would certainly, and you want to change over slowly to your um, polystyrene, I would certainly go for now, um, there's a, they're called, I think they're called swinty or swin, swinty um, hives, which are, I'm now beginning to use on Helen's hives, which are still wood ones, um, supers. Polystyrene super. So they're compatible with wooden ones. You're not having to buy a full set of polystyrene kits that only works with that particular hive. So mm. you can do this blending, mix and match between wood and polystyrene a lot more. Which if you're if you're mix yeah, and a lot of us are mixing and matching, we're not only starting in polystyrene. For you can do that with panes as well, Helen. You can use wooden along with the polystyrene I found. I should say that bees seem to survive anything, you know. I just fancy polystyrene hives because we live in a really cold, windy spot. But my bees were fine before I did this, so I think it's maybe just a personal fad rather than a necessity. You know, bees seem to survive in everywhere, don't they? People keep bees in Finland and in Canada where it's freezing for months and months on end. So it could just be um, a fad rather than a necessity. Rob, Rob covered a bit in his talk about the two different types of hive systems. And... Um, Mum certainly found that moving to polystyrene hives is probably extending her beekeeping career because they are much lighter to pick up. She's not so tired at the end of the day, that sort of thing. I mean, they're still heavy when they're full of honey, which obviously hasn't happened this year. But, you know, but in terms of manoeuvring the equipment around, which I think is still a valid yeah, reason to is. be using yes. more polystyrene hives as mum gets older. Yeah. yeah. Some people I've seen have, have gone on to double brood when they get older, but dummy down. So rather than having two double broods with 11 frames in, they've put some dummy boards in and have two double broods with, say, eight frames in each or seven frames in each. So they're lighter, but they're still wood and they're still the equipment that they've got. Yeah, and I think that goes back to your point, Phil, that as long as the bees have got a space to live in, um, they, don't. they don't really mind, do they? No, no, no. I like to think they, they like it. I know there's been... Like, more and more research showing that bees in trees don't cluster tightly all winter. They think the cluster might just be an emergency mechanism when it's so cold that they can't do anything else. So maybe they're a bit better off with more insulation, but they still survive regardless. So in the end, does it doesn't really matter. Um, just again, because I'm mindful, even if we don't have many beginners on this call, this is being recorded, Phil. Um, how many times do you go into the colony over the winter period? I only go in, well, I, apart from I heft once a month to see if there's any food, but I don't go in at all. Oh, I go in before I do oxalic acid treatment now, 
because um, the experts keep saying, if you're going to do it, you've got to uncap the brood before you do it. I know Anne hates this. I know you're going to be shaking your head. But I did that last year, and I just uncapped any brood that there was before I acid did it. So there was about 200 cells, I think, that were, had brood in them. But that's the only time I go in over winter, and I wait until sort of middle of spring then. Some interesting research. When people say, when you go into the hive in winter, you're letting all the heat out. But in a normal wooden hive, uh, I think Nottingham University did some research on some beehives in Sussex where they put temperature sensors in the hive. And they found that the temperature of the air, I think it was either one or two centimetres from the colony, from the cluster, was the same as the outside temperature. So the bees don't heat the hive, but they couldn't. In a, in a wooden hive, it's like living in a bus shelter. You couldn't heat it. So um, they don't heat the hive. So opening the hive isn't really a problem temperature-wise. And I think they found that in the middle of the cluster, even when you went through the cluster, in the summer, after 15 minutes, the temperature was back to normal. And in the winter, after an hour of looking through the cluster, the internal temperature was back to what it was before they started. So they say it's not a big problem to go into the hive temperature-wise in the winter because they do recover quite quickly. Because, of course, honey and the comb, that all holds heat as well. It's like a bit of a storage radiator. It holds the heat. So it's not a big problem if you do have to go in. Some people think, oh, you're letting all the heat out. But there's no heat in there, really, apparently. Um, uh, also, I know, tell us a little bit about the strapping and the concrete blocks and that sort of thing in this photo. Is it? I'm just thinking about preparing hives for the winter and some people talk about oh well we always put our mouse guards on and all that old bricks and etc etc just to of course, yes, things got to mention that. yes mouse guards yeah for people who don't know uh, in the winter honey is very attractive to all sorts of things, and lava and bees so mice can get in so you, you can put a mouse guard on the front which is made of tiny little holes that the bees can get through but mice can't get through you pin that on the entrance that keeps the mice out I, my hive stands are concrete blocks because uh, we live on a hill and getting um, wooden hive stands level was really difficult. So I just leveled off a paving slab and put some concrete blocks on that. I strapped them down so they don't get blown away. Uh, wooden hives, I don't think that would be a problem, but polystyrene hives might be. And these covers do sort of rattle around a bit. So I put these straps on just to hold them in the, the worst of the winds. But if they're... I should think a normal hive shouldn't blow over, but if you're in a really windy location, I guess you could strap it down just to be on the safe side. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've got under, there's a thing called underfloor entrances. I've modified my entrances. Normally, on, when you buy a hive, the entrance is just at the front and mice and wasps can get in quite easily. But I read about these underfloor entrances where you basically have a porch that goes underneath the floor and the entrance is up up in the middle of the hive and mice can't get around that, that 90 degree bend and wasps won't go into a, a dark space because it's so well defended. So I don't get any problem with wasps at all now because they just won't go into this tunnel to get up. So I don't have to bother with mouse guards or with wasp problems but that, if you do that's another thing to think about. Mum's got one of those um, entrance floors Phil and it absolutely stumped me to start with because I couldn't work out which side was the actual <laughs> opening of the hive. Of the is that hive. the one you showed me Anne last summer? I think you, you showed me an old thing was it? That's the one I'm yes. using. I got it from Richard. You, you, we Remember Richard we couldn't you couldn't really work out what how it worked and it it's on principle it's the same as what you've talked about phil but mm. it's got this wooden bit that you slot in yeah and they make they actually make an an into exit and entrance in around that wooden slot as well so they mm. have a side entrance as well as a, a main entrance oh yeah it's to work yeah well mine you could make you could modify any any floor entrance oh, it's almost like a periscope so you've got a, an l shape and apparently wasps won't go in. The bees can defend it so much more easily because in a normal hive entrance, if they can get through that hole, they're in. Mm. But with mine, it's a tunnel and the bees can line up and defend it much yeah. more easily. Yeah. I'll find some pictures and you know, talk about it sometime if you like. Um, I, if you've got time, it's nice to fiddle around and try all these things. And the 
internet has lots of funny ideas, but this was a good one and it seems to have worked. And just to be clear and go back again, particularly for those who maybe aren't on this call but are going to listen to the recording, uh, the association has the types of equipment for extracting that Phil was talking about. So we've got a communal extractor, a set of sieves. Um, yeah, they're, for the purpose of this talk, that's, they're the main things that we need to make sure that, that they're, they're member benefits, that they're there for a, um, a small higher charge to mm. take out, aren't they? And of course, the, the club buys jars on, in bulk, so you can buy cheap jars and lids. And also um, sugar syrup, um, and fondant, and then also the uh, medication as well, chemical medication if needs be. So. Yes. Hmm. This year, uh, I have to say, I had very little honey. The weather was just so bad that uh, summer came and then it started to rain. It didn't stop raining up where we are, so we've got very little honey. Tracy got 140 pounds. She only lives two miles away. So <laughs> but that's polyhives for you. Mm. I land 100 metres lower, so I think that's probably why she was below the cloud line. Um, some, people watching, some years you get lots of honey, some years you might not get very much, especially up in mid Wales where there's, there's not very much forage out there. You know, sheep fields are a bit like deserts for bees. There's no hedgerow now, there are no flowers. So it really is luck of the draw where you live. I think near a town you get more, you've got all the gardens, haven't you, and trees. And you're a bit more fortunate. Yeah. Are there, uh, are there any other questions? observations um are you prepared to share the, how much honey you've got in comparison to other years based on the number of hives that you have got? well i wouldn't have the exact because i can't remember how many hives i had last year but roughly roughly i think i probably had 15 hives last year and i got uh and i tried was it just under 900 pounds or just under 800 just under 800 pounds. just under 800 pounds Last year. last year. This year, I've got uh, 12, 12, um, 12 hives, and I've just got just under uh, £200 of honey, which I think I'm lucky to get. Mm. Um, and we did take some honey off early in the season as well, mm -hmm. just to make sure that we actually got a little bit of a crop. So... Yeah. so um, so it's like a, quarter, a quarter of normal, a quarter to a third of normal, then I suppose. Looking back over the years, because I do write it down religiously how much I, I get every year, um, this year has been exceptionally poor by other years, probably going back about five years, that I, I was getting more per hive than, um, than I've got this year. So it's, it hasn't been a, a good, good cropping year at all. Mm. I think this year it was the spring was so hot that a lot of flowers flowered really early and didn't make much nectar because it was so dry and then the summer came and it was so wet that we lost out on both camps didn't we? I only got a quarter of the honey I normally get, I normally get 100 pounds ish and I got 20 pounds so that's well the fifth. That, that, that um, percentage is not dissimilar Phil for you and no. for mum so mm. yeah. 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 I've got friends in Sussex that have got, they get tons a year and they say it's a real nightmare because it's just so hard to extract it all and bottle it all and sell it all. Yeah, <laughs> it's a shame. <laughs> I know, no sympathy at all. <laughs> yeah, well, we should be looking for what we've got. Exactly. Oh, oh, we have a very um, a lovely honey that we get from West Wales, so it's just... Yes, and it's, it's probably more or less organic because there's no no crops here that get sprayed you can't call it organic because you can't prove it but no. it probably is yeah. yeah do you think there are any other questions that people want to go through so this is the last of the series of beginners talks that we've done over over the summer um, and I wanted to say thank you to all the speakers who've been have all done excellent talks. It's been fantastic. And it's been a nice addition to our members' meetings as well. And I'm really pleased that quite a lot of members have come on these calls as well, just to top up and listen to each other, to speak and support each other. And I'm sure we've all learned something, even if we've done beekeeping for quite a while. 
whether or whether we're just starting out on our beekeeping journey. Um, for those who are interested in um, doing beekeeping or keeping an interest going over the winter months and into next year, um, please do become a member of the association to be, and be uh, part of our monthly meetings. We're going to be having monthly calls um, all the, uh, for the foreseeable future on a, a variety of topics and also hoping that members will start to share ideas and thoughts and experiences as well. So you get a good idea of sort of the local aspect of beekeeping within this area. And then also, if you'd like somebody to support you as a beginner beekeeper, then do please contact us via mum, via Anne, who's the secretary, because we can make sure that we try and link you up with a beekeeper local to your area um, and also support you through um, your early stages as best we can, um, despite COVID. So I'm sure it's possible for us to do that. Um, but I would like to say thank you very much to Phil for giving us a really excellent talk. Thank you, Phil. Um, fantastic. Thank you very much, Phil. Brilliant.